So now we're sort of moving into what we have done with actually trying to implement these, the systems that would produce these foods. Uh, it's a little bit hard to make out, but basically this is the, you know, this is most of our property as we came to it, looks like this. Uh, these are my kids from a few years ago digging black cohosh out of this area. So this is the first step that I've done in trying to sort of manage existing oaks and hickories is going through an area, uh, inventorying any understory plants that are at risk or useful in some way, and moving them out into sort of dedicated patches where pigs are not going to be. Um, you know, like I said before, my general perspective is that it's not the pigs that are the problem, but again, I'm on a private property, I'm having to fence my pigs into an area, they will absolutely root that stuff up, they will eat ginseng, they love it. Um, so, definitely, ideally the first step is to get this done. The, you know, part of the reason that this is viable for us is that I have these two kids and they were homeschooled at this time, so that's nice. Um, but also my partner uh, runs an apothecary, so that's an economically profitable activity for us. You know, we're moving this cohosh out, which is then getting grown out and used to make medicines. Um, which really, I think in general, if this is the approach you're taking towards these things, managing these existing forest, in my mind, this is the way to make it economically viable. There's definitely markets that are currently growing for understory medicinals. Okay, so second step is cut down a whole lot of tulip poplar. So tulip poplar, in case you don't know, is the magnolia species. That's, it's the most populous tree in our area. Uh, that was not at all the case until about 200 years ago when you know, at which point indigenous population in the area was basically removed. Um, I guess to some degree I feel like that's disrespectful. There are still indigenous people here. Their broad scale effect on the landscape was removed. Um, so basically indigenous folks throughout the eastern woodland would burn the understory of the forest every single year. Um, they definitely had sort of rotations where they didn't necessarily burn every area every single year, but the effect that that had was that it promoted mast species, which tend to be fire resistant, which is oaks, hickories, black walnuts, um, all that stuff, persimmons. Um, and it would reduce things that are not fire resistant, like tulip poplar, red maple, um, those trees specifically are the fastest growing in our area and what I have seen is that the logging practices in our area are essentially creating tulip poplar monocultures. They want to go through and harvest out logs as rapid, you know, on a cycle that's as rapid as they can get it because that's the way to make that profitable. Um, the only trees that can actually get up to a marketable saw log in that time is tulip poplar. So anyways, that was my first step in here, is to go out and try to, you know, the goals of this primarily is to release the mass trees, so give them more soil resources and more sunlight by removing trees that we don't want. The other thing, because I'm running animals, is to try to get more understory growth to feed those animals throughout the year, whereas the mass trees are just dropping in the fall. So I, what I try to do is fell the tulip poplars as close to on contour as I can get them so that then over time they act as a sort of fertility catch. So I'll take all of the slash and branches and stuff if I have time and pile it up on that uphill side. What happens over time is that when the leaves drop and start moving downhill, they all hit that and catch and just makes a massive leaf pile. Um, on some of the oldest areas where I've done this, I was like leading a tour and just sort of stuck my hand in and it just kept going into the ground. Like there, it's so moist and spongy, there's so much vole and insect habitat in there that they're just making pockets. It's basically a compost pile. So in the first stages when I was doing this, I was just 
you know, what I was hoping to get out of that tulip poplar was uh, fertility, basically. And so a friend of mine came out and was really excited about growing mushrooms. What he started doing is I would fell the trees, he would come back with a chainsaw and just make a straight cut about halfway into the log every three to four feet, and then feed oyster mushroom spawn into those cuts. Um, and that worked amazingly. You can see this white here, that's all oyster mycelia. Um, so that whole log is now full of oyster. And, uh, and when we get decent rains, like every one of those cuts will just be coated in oyster mushrooms. The downside of that system that I've found is that oyster mushrooms have a very uh, short harvest window and a very short shelf life. So trying to turn them into a marketable crop or really even a subsistence crop is kind of difficult. The people I've met that actually make money off of selling oyster mushrooms are doing it in controlled grow rooms where they don't have bugs and rain and fungus and all that stuff. Um, so I would say that th that idea I think is totally great and viable, but I would try to do it like along a walking path that you're gonna be walking on every single day. That's great. But that's been the issue is like, I'll catch them three days too late and they're just not even food. Uh, the times that I have caught one of these logs like in prime harvest point, I filled up a hiking backpack with like 80 pounds of mushrooms off of one log. Um, so, okay, and then this is sort of the, so there are some species that I, that are useful to me. These species are, in this picture, are black locust and elm. They're excellent animal fodders. What I'm doing with those, rather than trying to eliminate them out, is I either coppice or pollard them to try to utilize that over time. So all of that woody debris is then getting incorporated back in building soil over time, uh, and the leaves are getting used as animal fodder. This is actually, so I used to raise goats, I now have sheep and pigs. Um, so this today is the first time we've had rain at our place in over a month. I'm feeding my sheep a lot of tree leaves because the ground forage is basically dead. Um, this, in the time that we've lived at our place, there's been three growing seasons that were some stage of drought. Uh, the worst one was that, well, I think it was 2016, where there was like massive wildfires all over the area. Um, I had a lot of issues trying to keep animals alive on a forage-based diet. Uh, but this is definitely a way to sort of mitigate that. Trees are getting water from much deeper down. Uh, yeah. That's honestly, though, a whole other topic from nuts. Okay, so this is a sort of another stage or potential for this idea. So this, you can see, this is again a tulip poplar that I felled on contour, piled up brush on the uphill side, electric lines running on the uphill side with pigs inside. So this makes a sort of a contoured swale, and if you've heard that term from the permaculture world, Basically, this area is a, you know, I tend to sort of segregate things between intensive managed areas and extensive managed areas. So in the extensive areas, I'm trying to just like run pigs under oaks once a year. That's the most I would hope to get out of that area. In an intensive area, I'm like planting really dense rows of hazelnuts, running pigs three to five times a season, like flash grazing them for 24 hours, like really utilizing a space hard. This I would say is somewhere in between. Uh, this, this is a sloped area, so I'm not trying to manage it super intensively, uh, but this hillside was essentially pure tulip poplar when we got there, and it's really close to our house, so easy to work on. This, so this, what I do in areas like this, uh, it's a little bit hard to make out, but these, are chestnut seedlings planted at about three feet apart on the downhill side of that tulip poplar. So again, we're getting that fertility catch on the uphill side. Uh, it's kind of like a heavy mulch on that one side of that tree, then just forestry style planting those trees in, you know, just like stick a shovel in, shove the tree in, stomp it in place, that's it. 
Um, when I plant, most of my trees that I plant, I try to get them for as cheap as I possibly can or grow them myself from seed, plant as many of them as I possibly can, and assume that the strongest ones are gonna survive. Um, again, that's, in a lot of ways, that's me trying to sort of, uh, you know, thread that needle of economic viability. If I went out and planted grafted chestnuts like this, I'd have to be out there irrigating them, fertilizing them, you know, each of those trees would be 30 to 40 bucks up front. Uh, you know, the economics of that versus a tree, I think these chestnuts I bought for $2 a piece. So I can plant a lot of these and have half of them die and still not, you know, my costs are still not even close to a more sort of intensive. But again, what I'm hoping to get out of this is mainly pig food. If you were trying to grow chestnuts as like a market crop, you would want to go with grafted trees and treat it just like an orchardist treats apples. One question, when you're talking about browsing your hazelnut four to six times a year, which, which species of animals? Um, I'll show that a little bit further in. Um, yeah. This is a sort of wide shot of this hillside I was just talking about. So you can see pretty clearly roughly on contour, tulip poplar rose. Uh, this is my little solar panel fence charger. You can see this is an area where pigs are in this picture. This is the area they were in the longest ago. Um, so yeah, rotational grazing, again, kind of like outside the scope of this class. Um, but definitely, you know, that's my feeling in general is that any of these nuts, if you're trying to spend a lot of time and labor on nuts in our area, you wanna to try to stack as many other activities into that space as you can to make that a viable activity. So whether that's forest medicinals, animals, annual crops, any of those things, that's how you're gonna make this actually viable. Question? Yeah. I just missed if you said that you planted uh, hybrid or American chestnuts. Those were Chinese chestnut yeah. seedlings. Yeah, okay. that's I've mostly planted Chinese, just Chinese seedlings because, uh, like I said before, chestnuts are really not my favorite, so I haven't got real into the nitty gritty of all the genetics of it. Hazel's very much the opposite. I'm very into the nitty gritty of all that. Um, Chinese chestnut, as far as I have heard and seen, is the one that guaranteed will live through blight in our area. Um, they're also super easy to get. I've actually got a friend who goes around and harvests from old homestead trees around the area and just grows out that seed, which really that would be, that's the best thing to do. That's, I mean, I guess I'll talk about this a little bit with hazelnuts, but just sort of on that topic, my feeling in general is that there's definitely potential in like the American Chestnut Foundation type stuff or any of these sort of like intensive breeding programs to sort of improve the viability of these trees. The issue that I've seen is that the, the economics of making that project function over the decades that are required is really difficult. It requires humans that can actually work together, which is not easy to find, and it requires a huge amount of money. So like uh, either a nonprofit that can generate lots of money, like the Chestnut Foundation is required, or a university is kind of required. Um, there are people that have tried to do it outside of those systems and basically failed over the course of 30 years. Um, so. Um, okay, so this, I'm not gonna talk a ton about this, but this is a project I did for a friend where he terraced the bottom part of this slope trying to get uh, more, you know, there is basically an old sloped pasture. This is what most of their property looks like. Uh, they run an herb school and grow, the, you know, this guy is in his 70s, he grew up on a farm. He grows a garden, that's like what he does all the time. So he wanted more space for gardening, uh, annuals and medicinals. So we rented a track hoe, we dug the terraces, um, we planted all these banks. So the top of these banks and the top of the cut slope um, are planted with 
fruit trees, but you definitely could do that with nuts. The bottom edge of this whole slope is planted with hazels on about a three foot spacing. So this is, uh, you know, I'll get more into specifics about hazels, but the place that I see hazels thriving in our local area is on road banks, is on cut slope road banks. Uh, they can, they have in a massive root system compared with their stems. Uh, so for stabilizing slopes, they work extremely well. The other reason that I think they're a perfect fit for this sort of project is that as of now, after you know working with hazelnuts pretty intensively for eight years, I cannot with 100% confidence tell you these are the hazelnuts you should plant in order to get an awesome yield out of them. I think it's gonna be at least another five years before I've got a suite of plants I could sell somebody that I can say, these are gonna produce for you. So that said, in order to get to that point, I need to plant tens of thousands of them. So how am I gonna pull that off? Um, so basically, I try to produce plants and sell them for as cheap as I possibly can. I sold them to this guy for this project for uh, $3 a piece, I think. So we planted them at super tight spacing and what he is expecting to get out of them is stabilization of that slope. That's it. He's not expecting to you know, sell hazelnut kernels to French broad chocolate um, and make his living. So in my, you know, that's sort of what I've come to is that is the path forward with hazelnuts is they are awesome at sort of ecosystem services that most people don't tend to account for. Um, and then, you know, as we get more and more of those plants out there and can select out of those massive populations, that's how we can sort of incrementally push that forward without having to do that, you know, huge scale breeding work that I was talking about before. Um, and this was, let's see, this was uh, two years ago, no, a year and a half ago. And all of this looks great. The hazels were two-year-old seedlings. A bunch of them flowered this last winter. I haven't been back to check if they actually produced any nuts, maybe a few, um, but yeah, doing very well. I have a quick question. Yeah. Are you, are you using just the, uh, the Native American uh, hazels, I'm sorry, versus any hybrids and such? I'm using everything. Everything I can get my hands on really is what I'm using. This, on, so on this project, I planted both pure Americans, uh, Coralis Americana, and I planted hybrids from Forest Ag Enterprises, which is Mark Shepard's farm up in Wisconsin. The, from what I've seen in the you know, six or seven years of growing both of those, like you would expect, the Native American one, growth rates, survivability, adaptability, unbeatable. Like I've planted them with no irrigation into established pasture grass in a drought year and had like 80% survivability. So uh, versus the hybrids, which, you know, they're okay. They've got American genes in them, they'll do okay. But in general, they're growing at about half the rate of my Americans. What's the height that you've got it? Are you pruning them regularly? Like comparison, you know, you're saying half of it. Right, we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but basically, uh, hazels, I would not prune the way that you prune like an apple tree, just because they don't produce as intensively as those sorts of plants. The ideal way to, pr to prune these multi-stemmed hazels, which is what the Americans and the hybrids are gonna be, is to coppice them to the ground about every seven years. Um, I wouldn't start doing that until they're about 10 years old, um, but that's, it's just, it's a much more simple process than trying to go in individually. On a smaller planting, what I have done and would recommend is pruning them the way you'd prune blueberries, where you go in and you shoot for having one third old stems, one third medium age stems, and then one third juvenile stems. So the goal in that is to constantly have juvenile growth to keep the plant healthy. Um, yeah. Okay, this is that same area 
just sort of showing my, I guess a couple of things I mentioned in here. So this, the way that I mulched the tree planting here is with slabs from a sawmill. If you can get your hands on those, awesome material for tree planting. They're flat on one side, so they lay flat on the ground. If you flip these up at this point, there's worm and ant galleries covering the entire ground underneath them, and that's exactly what you want. Um, this upper picture, this is, uh, so this is after like six months of growth. This is a hybrid poplar. It's hard to make out, but there's a couple of these Amorpha fruticosa, also called false indigo in there. Uh, so hybrid poplar, I actually just saw a study showing that it does fix nitrogen. It also just grows extremely fast. So my goal in these sorts of plantings is to have some of these really fast growing species just to act as a support for what I'm hoping to get a crop out of. What I've seen is that woody plants in general will, will establish the best in part shade. Um, so if you're planting in an area like this that's just full sun, if you can grow something like this that's gonna get eight to 10 feet in a season and start putting down some shade to keep moisture in the area and sort of start to get towards that mid-succession forest, which is kind of what we're trying to create, that's good. Uh, Amorpha fruticosa is that other one I was talking about, similar thing, it's a bean family nitrogen fixer, grows extremely fast, coppices very well, um, yeah. <laughs>